Hi folks, Matt Easton here again. So, the five questions thing, well it seems to be popular. There are so many good questions just under my first video um, that I'm filming another video straight on the back of the last one. I won't upload it on the same day, but um, some great questions guys, so thank you so much. Um, it's loads of uh, interesting material, so let's take a look. So first up, Jacko369 says, what were the strangest weapons recorded in the history of organised duels? Um, well, you know what, there's lots of things I could talk about, but two things come instantly to mind. And in both of these cases, we don't know that it was ever actually done. Um, it was just proposed. And um, the first is, you can see it in Talhofer, um, uh, and it, it's essentially when a judicial duel, that is trial by combat, is going to happen, and one person is a man and one person is a woman, what they do is they make the man stand in a pit and give him a club, and the woman it stands on the ground and has a rock in a sock, essentially. <laughs> so uh, this was deemed that somehow, in the eyes of God, this would make an equal match for the man to stand in a pit up to his waist and for the woman to be free-moving but to have a rock in a sock. That's pretty damn weird in my books. Uh, the other weird thing that comes to mind, and this wasn't done, I'm fairly certain, it wasn't, in fact I know this was never done but it was proposed, and I can't, you can look it up if you Google it, someone out there will be able to find out who it was. I can't remember who it was that um, proposed this for a duel, but someone was um, challenged to a duel, I think it was in 19th century America, and uh, in response the person who's been challenged gets to choose the weapons and they chose hot air balloons and shotguns. <laughs> so both people would go up in hot air balloons and then shoot at each other with shotguns, which I think is uh, just amazing. Um, so there we go, those are probably the two that come instantly to mind, two of the weirdest uh, things proposed for duels, but I don't think either of them ever happened. So Matt O'Connor says, hey Matt, Excluding firearms, what two weapons would you choose, not just in my collection generally, but of any weapons, in a zombie apocalypse or um, on the road type of situation? Ah, now I'd like to say, hmm, I've never thought about this, but come on, everyone who, <laughs> anyone who watches those kind of movies or watches Walking Dead, which I do, anyone who owns swords or firearms, uh, which I do, has, has at some point had a, a conversation in the pub uh, along these lines. So, uh, what two weapons, I can only choose two weapons, uh, aside from firearms, so let's say that I've already got a rifle, um, and a handgun. There we go. So I've already got a rifle and a handgun, and um, I've got to I've got to choose two other weapons that I would take. Well, very simply, a knife. Um, it, it is just <laughs> you need a knife. You need a knife for so many things. Um, and so I take a Bowie knife. Um, I've got various Bowie knives that any of them would do. Um, so I take a Bowie knife because it's a good general purpose knife. It's good uh, in a self defence situation. It's also good as a tool. Um, it, it's good for all sorts of things, so definitely a bowie knife um, and I, I, for a second I would think maybe a cookery but then I would think, no, I think on balance a bowie knife has more advantages than a cookery um, some people, f feel free to disagree but there we go and, um, and then I'd have to take a sword wouldn't I, come on man it's me so I'd take a sword and a knife, so a bowie knife and the type of sword I'd take, I'd almost certainly take one of my cutlasses and the reason for that um, it's quite simply because they're easier to carry. If I'm, if you're in a zombie apocalypse or, uh, or in a kind of survival situation, Armageddon type situation, you want something that's easy to carry in all situations, in and out of cars or in and out of vehicles, whatever they might be, um, on and off bikes or horses or whatever, um, uh, and uh, just kind of easy to carry, not too heavy, not too long. Uh, so cutlass all the way, man. I mean, I've 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 um, put my I've staked my name next to the cutlass uh, previously when it came to sort of you know home defence uh, kind of scenario, um, and I think cutlasses have it all. They've got great hand protection, good cutting capacity, good thrusting capacity. They're not so short that if someone's got a longer weapon, you're at a massive disadvantage, uh, but they're short enough to be convenient. So cutlass all the way. Um, and I think the cutlass I'd take is probably one that I've got that was made for a private yacht by Wilkinson Sword Company. So I know it's a good, I know it's a good quality uh, weapon, and it's nice and handy, choppy and thrusty. So Warstein or Vorstein one says, why did Roman legionaries wear good torso protection? 
Plus carried a shield, but had no arm or wrist protection at all. Well, uh, the first part of that question is the assumption that they had good torso protection. Well, yeah, generally they did. Um, however, most people think Roman legionaries, they think of lorica segmentata, that is the overlapping plates, it's a little bit like a coat of plates, um, as featured in numerous films um, and by various reenactment societies. One thing that's worth pointing out is that Roman legionaries wore male shirts for longer than they wore lorica segmentata. Lorica segmentata was only really worn, as I understand it, I'm not a Roman ex expert, but it was only worn in certain parts of the empire and a certain time frame, you're looking at, I think, kind of first century and a bit into the second century. Um, whereas male shirts are actually more common over a greater period of time. Now, that's not to say a male shirt isn't a good protection for your torso, it is a pretty damn good protection for your torso. Um, so why didn't, to get to the actual question, why didn't they wear, why didn't they wear arm and wrist protection, let's say arm, arm, armour? Well, Sometimes they did. Uh, so very famously, they adopted the gladiatorial manica, which was made of overlapping either metal, um, either metal hoops or uh, sometimes leather. It seems to have possibly been in some cases. Um, but they did wear manica on their sword arm, on their right sword arm, in some campaigns. I believe they may have worn them in the Dacian campaign, but again, I'm not a Roman expert. But anyway, they did certainly adopt. Uh, gladiatorial um, arm protection as used by um, I think Thracian and uh, Secutor maybe uh, gladiators um, in some cases why did they not use, why did they not wear any on their left arm they don't need it because they've got a huge scutum when you hold a scutum it the shield comes up to your shoulder your your left arm's completely hidden behind the shield uh, incidentally, I have trained people in um, Scutum and Gladius. It's not something I've talked a lot about in video yet, but it's something I will probably talk about in the future. Um, I was training people in the use of Scutum and Gladius for a TV show. I was more or less new to it when I came to it, but through intensive training, I've now had some degree of experience with Scutum and Gladius, and I now have some things to say about it, which I will do in the future. Um, but very simply, why did the Romans not usually wear arm protection on their right arm? Because again, you don't usually need it. Um, if, you're, if you're fighting in formation with a large Scutum, and Scutums really are large, quite simply, your arm isn't very vulnerable. The line to your, assume, assuming you're right-handed and your opponent is right-handed, it's very difficult for them to even get to your arm because the shield's in the way. Quite simply, the shield blocks the line to the arm. And uh, even if we go to medieval swordsmanship, if we look at sword and buckler, that's what makes medieval cross-hilted swords in a civilian context where you've got no hand protection. That's part of what can make them safer to use and why the hand isn't so much at risk as you might think because you're using a buckler in the left hand or sometimes a shield and that protects the line, the natural line, to your hand. So it's very difficult to get to a swordsman's sword arm and hand if there's a shield there because it blocks the trajectory to it. So Robin Ogg Strike Force Survival um, says, how would you change Olympic fencing to make it more represent a one-on-one -on -one duel? Well, there are essentially three types of Olympic fencing, aren't there? There's foil, epée, and sabre, and they each have different rules and different weapons. Um, let's take epée, okay? That's probably the easiest one for me to uh, apply to. I'll try and be as short as possible. How would I change epée? Um, I would probably very slightly change the uh, body targeting. I would take the um, I'd take the feet out, I'd make the feet an invalid target um, and I would also uh, bring in, the most important element that I would bring in is a bigger time difference to score a scoring hit. So at the moment if you hit it at exactly the same time it's classed as a double um, and that essentially doesn't give either person a point advantage. Um, however, if you hit within one twenty-fifth of a second, or thereabouts, before the other person, then you score a point and they don't. Even if you hit them in the kneecap and then half a second later, or less, a third of a second later, they thrust you in the face, you win the point. That's dumbass, I'm sorry, but by any measure that's kind of really, in fencing terms, that's just ridiculous. 
really fucking ridiculous and it really annoys me. Yes, I have done EPE. Um, I fenced foil at school, I fenced Sabre at university and I fenced EPE for a little bit, not very much, um, after university. Um, and I think it's ridiculous. However, with a small few, for a few small tweaks to the rules, I think that um, certainly EPE fencing could be made uh, better. And I would increase the amount of time for what counts as a double, and I would say if you get a double, you get no points. Um, you could have penalties for doubles as well, that would make it even more realistic, that's what we do in HEMA. Um, but I think if you just to tr just change one thing in EPE, um, it would be the time difference between what's a scoring point and what's a double. Um, if you were going to add more things and change more things, I would bring in something equivalent to what we use in HEMA, which is the afterblow. That is, if I hit you um, in, um, if I hit you first, doesn't matter where it is, and then you hit me very soon after, very quickly after, um, then that's not good for either of us, okay? Because the person who got hit first, clearly they messed up because they got hit first, but the person who got second also messed up because they didn't, either they attacked so recklessly that they didn't close a line or they didn't attack in the correct tempo, or um, they didn't recover quickly enough. And if you look at even, even early 20th century fencing manuals or fencing texts, recovery under guard is still a very big thing. The, the people still realise that when you hit someone, you have to then get out safely again as well. And this is being utterly lost in modern Olympic fencing, which is why we get this, I'm sorry I'm going to swear, this fucking ridiculous um, activity of charging towards the opponents and frantically stabbing each other. It's just ludicrous, it's ridiculous. Um, and I understand it's an abstract sport, but it really gets my go. That's why I do historical fencing. If you're, if you're fed up with that bollocks, just switch to doing historical fencing. Okay, next question. So, score peak, I think I would say it. Um, could you do a video about English heraldry? I'm not going to do that and mention your coat of arms, in brackets, the Scholar Gladiatoria one. Well, what I am going to talk about is the second part of that question. The Scholar Gladiatoria logo is not a coat of arms. So, um, some, something we have to be specific about is that in Eng English heraldry, and this is pretty much all I'll say on that big topic, is um, quite simply, it has to be recognised by the College of Arms. We have a, an official institution who've existed since Henry V's time, from around the Battle of Agincourt, from something like 1412 or 1415, around there, around the time of Agincourt, um, where you can only use, you can only legally, officially use a coat of arms if it's registered and paid for at the College of Arms. Um, there's one bit of my family um, which has or had a coat of arms um, and I did a bit of research into it and I found that they had purchased the coat of arms, they bought the right to use it in 1830. It doesn't go back any further than that at all. They were um, quite successful in uh, building ships and uh, importing brandy and so they thought, ah, we're rich, we want a coat of arms so that uh, we can have our coat of arms on things just like our neighbours who are actual aristocracy have. So, essentially in England, uh, England and Wales, I think, um, because I think Scotland has a completely, di yeah, I'm fairly sure Scotland has a completely different system for, for uh, coats of arms, but in England and Wales we have the College of Arms, and you can only use a coat of arms if it's registered with them, and there are essentially two types of people, there's people, or two types of coats of arms, there's, there's coats of arms which go back a long way, and have come from old aristocracy, Democratic families, many of whom go, it goes all the way back to William the Conqueror, um, or in some cases from you know later centuries, uh, but they've had them from you know centuries. And then there's a lot of people in the 18th and 19th century who um, their families did well in the Industrial Revolution, and uh, and so they got a coat of arms to so that they could look more like the aristocratic families they wanted to emulate. Um, and um, in terms of the Scholar Gladiatoria logo, it is not a coat of arms, it is just a logo. And what does it mean? It's very simple, it comes, it's inspired purely by Fiore de Liberi's um, treatises and his, his system, and he uses allegorical symbols um, for um, showing certain qualities of a swordsman. 
and there are four animals. There's, a, there's an elephant, a tiger, a lion and a lynx. Our logo is a lynx. You'll notice it has a short stubby tail and pointy ears, much like me. Um, and uh, the lynx is the symbol for judgment and prudence. And um, so we decided to, or we, me, I decided to use the lynx as our symbol and then it is surrounded by two they're they're supposed to be palms of victory. Again, this is a symbol that is shown in Fiore's treaties uh, in the dagger section, where one of the dagger masters holds a palm front to show that he's victorious. So it's Fiore's lynx surrounded by Fiore's um, palm leaves of victory. Finally, bonus question: Vesrox Vesrox says, "Have you ever considered growing a goatee?" I've had a goatee at various points. In fact, I had a massive fuck-off beard um, uh, for probably about a year of my life. Um, and so, yeah, I've had all types of facial hair. Um, and uh, believe it or not, I used to have hair on the top of my head as well. Cheers, folks. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe. Follow us on Facebook. You can buy T-shirts through Spreadshirt. Support us on Patreon or follow us on Pinterest. Thank you.